fuck it, man. Let's fucking chat. Welcome to the Mouthpiece, episode two, year one. Today, we're going to talk about the main event at the World Series of Poker. My deep runs, my bad runs, and then we're going to bring the current World Series of Poker champion, John Sin, on for an interview. We're going to take your phone calls, listen to your emails, hear on the mouthpiece. All right, everybody, welcome to the mouthpiece, episode two, year one. Um, on my podcast, we're gonna talk about a lot of stories about me, um, my life, things I've done in poker things i've done away from poker um a lot of good stories a lot of bad stories a lot of funny stories so this is really gonna be a authentic type of podcast so when you listen you know you're getting it from the heart you're not gonna hear things that are a bunch of bullshit that's made up to make myself look good, which seems like that's the thing people like to do nowadays, which I can't stand. So, you know, this is where you're gonna get it. So we're gonna we're gonna backtrack to the main event of 1997 that was the year that Stu Unger won his third world championship outside in May and it was a 103 degree heat wave uh it was the hottest day like ever in May uh, that was 1997 of course that's before global warming became a big thing i don't know why we had such a hot day that day um but i was outside if you look at the video of when Stu Unger won his third world championship i was there from the beginning of the final table to the very end i had you know become a professional poker player in 96 of November. So this was um, six months after I first turned pro. I had never played a hand in No Limit Hold'em in my life. I was always, I consider I probably top three Limit Hold'em players in the world from 1996 through probably 2000, I would say, where I started playing mixed games and went away from Limit Hold'em because it was a dying game. But I was um, convinced that uh, before I jumped into playing No Limit Hold'em, I was going to learn the game. So um, I kind of watched the main event final table. I watched every hand. And I watched Stu Unger just pick that table apart but he didn't do it like playing super fast like when he got the chips I guess leading up to the final table he was probably as fast as anybody but at this table it was very methodical very slow and I learned a lot kind of watching the way he controlled the table without risking many chips. Now, he was so far and above the best player at that final table. It was really not even close. Uh, But I do remember it like it was yesterday. I just don't remember all the players because it was now 20 two years ago wow (laughs) so uh that was my first venture into the main event in 1998 
a guy that was staking me uh, when I left my job as a um, poker dealer in 96 from Samstown. Um, I was making him so much money that he decided that he was going to stake Scotty in 1998. Um, and Scotty won him 66000 during the World Series, but the guy didn't want to put up the 10K for Scotty in the main event, which was really kind of stupid. But as you all know, and if you don't know, I had a dream that Scotty won the World Series, and I basically told Scotty I want to put him in satellites, and I put Scotty in five $1,000 satellites, and my bankroll wasn't very big. I think it was maybe, I don't know, fifteen or 20000 so I basically gave Scotty like 25% of my bankroll. Uh, and then I said, uh, well, I, I can't put you in another one, Scotty. And they all said, there's one more satellite and we're done for the night. And there was no morning satellite. So that was the last satellite before the main event. You could not buy in or win a satellite into the World Series main event after that last satellite. So I said to Scotty, I'll put up 500 and we got two other people to put up 250 Lo and behold, Scotty won that satellite and went on to win the World Series. Uh, I got a third. The two people that put 250 a piece up got 16%, and uh, Scotty got a third. And he went on and, like as you know, the won the World Series in 1998. I had a dream he won it, and afterwards the guy who was staking me and who staked Scotty the whole World Series like said I have to give him a hundred thousand, and I'm like I I ain't giving you nothing. Why would I? You didn't want to stake Scotty in the main event. I used like twenty five percent of my bankroll to put Scotty in and to win a try and win a satellite, and uh, that was my fallout with. Uh, the guy was staking me Neil after that. Uh, he felt like I wronged him by not giving him 100000 which is completely ridiculous. I said I'd give him like 10 or 15 Just I don't even know why I even offered him that much. I think I might even offer him like 25 or 30 I don't even know. Only because he was staking me and then he had done a lot for me and then, you know, I felt bad that he staked Scotty and then decided not to stake Scotty when he won the main event, but, you know, that's his fault, and I still to this day don't feel I did anything wrong with that, but that was my uh, venture into the 98 World Series. Now, I still had not played a hand of No Limit Hold'em yet, so I was a kind of perfectionist, so I, I wanted to make sure, uh, you know, I knew what I was doing before I jumped in to play No Limit Hold'em, so... I watched the final table of Stu in 97. I watched, like, Scotty every day from day one all the way through when he won it. It was interesting to watch. You know, I'm, I, I was pretty excited. I, I remember telling my parents who were running the carpet and furniture store that, oh, don't worry about me. Scotty's going to win the World Series for a million. I'm going to get a third of a million, and I'll never have to worry about money again. And my parents thought I was crazy, of course, and Scotty and Scotty won it. They were in shock. They couldn't believe it. And it's pretty a pretty surreal story because uh, I used to have always had dreams of, like, not just winning poker terms, but, like, certain vivid dreams, and they would always come true. And un until I got sick, those dreams continued to come through all the way through till. 2013 and we'll touch on that a little bit later but so now we go into like 1999 and um, I started talking with different people about No Limit because I decided okay I, I think I know what I'm doing I've watched enough of it I've read enough it's time for me to jump in now back then there was uh, two World Series there was two No Limit Hold'em tournaments a year there was the main event for 10k and there was a $3,500 buy-in 
right before the main event, which was the second biggest tournament in the world of in the world, and uh, it usually got about three hundred players, I think. So uh, I talked to like Eskimo Clark. I don't know if you all know who he is, but he actually knew a lot about No Limit Hold'em before a lot of people did. And he basically gave me like how to pick up dead money. Of course, I asked him what dead money was <laughs> and he explained that to me. And so now I just, I figured out, all right, I, I know what I'm doing there. Let's, uh, let's take a shot. So the first No Limit Hold'em tournament I play is the 3500 of 1999. And um, if you look back and check it out, I end up winning the tournament for, I think it was 250 or 260,000. I knew how good I was in Hold'em, but I didn't know how good I was transferring from Limit Hold'em to No Limit Hold'em. Once Eskimo gave me a bunch of things of how to pick up dead money, what to stay away from, uh, how to be aggressive. I uh, kind of used everything he kind of told me along with what different people told me, what Scotty told me, with what I learned from watching. And I I went on to win that uh, first No Limit tournament I ever played in 1999, the 3500 No Limit at the World Series. Um, and I, my confidence level was really high. The guy who gave me all the chips at that final table, a Noel Furlong, the Irishman, he ended up winning the 1999 main event. Um, I remember watching that, and that was Huck Seed's second final table at the main event, too. I think he finished third or fourth. But it was kind of interesting to see the guy that, I thought was a lunatic that gave me all the chips when I won my first bracelet, go on and win the 99 main event. I was really confident then that I knew what I was doing and because of the, my skill factor and being able to read cards so well, uh, I started to dominate No Limit Hold'em. And it was real important that I won that bracelet because as good as I was in No Limit Hold'em, I wasn't getting the credit in the poker world I deserved. And now, and I understand like these young kids, like that's why I always say they're when they're so hungry, they want to prove how good they are and that they can compete with the best. So I was, people were all saying, "Oh, Mike Madison, the guy that stakes Scotty when he won the main event," and I was just known as Mike Madison, the guy who stakes Scotty, and it was starting to piss me off because I knew how good I was. So. I'm like, well, fuck, I'm sick of being told the guy, take Scotty, I got to win my own bracelet. So, you know, I won the 99 World Series uh, No Limit. And um, even though I would have won the 97 Omaha 8 or better championship, if I gave a shit what about bracelets, I had a 11 to 1 chip lead. It was me, Ted Forrest, Scotty win. And uh, we made a deal. I got... All, I got all but 20,000. I think first was 146. They gave me 126. We gave like an extra 15 to Scotty, an extra 5,000 to Ted Forrest. So once we were head up, I just was already paid. Uh, I mean, my first six figure score, I was throwing that $100,000 brick around in the back of the limo like I had won the lottery because, wow, I mean, from poker dealer in 96, I'm working for $100 a day to having a hundred thousand dollar brick of money in front of me it was pretty surreal actually but uh but you know i hated being like i said uh you know the, you know, the guy that takes scotty that, that that couldn't play or whatever so i knew how good i could play so i won that first bracelet. so that was really good but we go to 2000 i remember that was the year chris ferguson won the main event uh and i watched him get it all in against tj cloutier and ace nine versus ace queen and hit the nine on the river and it goes to say like i tell everybody one card changes your future or can change the dynamic of where you are in poker like would chris ferguson have made it big in poker 
if that nine ever hit, would the full tilt ever has existed? Would he have been? Um, would he have been Chris Ferguson, the you know the guy who's won many braces? Was it six braces now? Five, whatever. So you know everything changes uh, by a card. Uh, so I remember that. So. We're going to go about now. We're going to kind of go into May in 2001, um, a main event. I was a polished, sharp, no limit hold them tournament player at this time now. So my first no limit event of 99 that I won, I was confident I of everything I did. Uh, I was in the Carlos Mortensen, Phil Hummett, Daniel Negreanu, Lane Flack. Scotty Wing category of top no limit players because I I understood what needed to be done. I understood the aggression before everybody under else understood the aggression. And I I look back at that event and I I remember being at a table with Mike Sexton. I had and. And Mike was like the ambassador of poker before there was really the ambassador of poker. So, by the way, we're going to have Mike Sexton on next week. So, <laughs> I just raised eight hands in a row or seven hands in a row. And now I look down, I had do seven offsuit under the gun. I raised, everybody folded. Mike looks at me, he's in the big blind. He goes, oh, you raised my big blind from the one hole? I'm like, really? He goes... You have a hand every hand. I'm like, I, I can't help it, Mike. That they're just dealing me great cards, and uh, that was. And then Mike folded, and I didn't show nothing. And I'm not think that's when I realized like how much farther ahead of the curve I was. And I remember going to see how Phil Helmuth is doing, and I, I had a lot of chips, so I had walking chips to take some. And I just kind of walked over and watched him play around and. Phil raised every hand, <laughs> like every hand. I'm like, okay, I'm definitely doing the right thing here. So in 2001, I, I kind of dominated. Um, I had pretty much uh, top five in chips almost from day one all the way through to the end. Um, and uh, key hand came up with me and Carlos with about, 13 players to go and where I had Jack 10, he had raised, it came Jack high. I had re-raised him, he had called. Uh, now, again, you guys gotta understand, there wasn't like raising and re-raising light going on back then. So the only ones that really did it were me, Helmuth, Negreanu, Huxseed, Scotty. I mean, there's like maybe Lane Flack. There's maybe like seven, eight of us that were, and the rest of us were just weak pussies. They didn't know nothing about the game. So it was fun to be able to run over people back then. And and um, the flop uh, came like Jack High and Carlos checked and I bet and Carlos check raised me and I re-raised them all in. And Carlos tanked for like five minutes, right? And showed me ace jack face up. I showed him jack 10. He went fucking berserk. It was probably a big bad show for me because I didn't want Carlos coming after me, but I didn't mind, but whatever. So now we fast forward to the final table of 2001. Now, Daniel, I was really pulling for. He was probably my best friend in poker and 2001 and he ended up getting 11th we really wanted him at the final table too it was pretty unlucky Daniel didn't make it so I was kind of hurt that Daniel finished 11th I, I really wanted him at that final table with us because we would have had a good time uh, we go on the final table of 2001 uh, Carlos was first in chips and this was a stack final table it was me Helmuth Carlos Dewey Tomko I had you know started doing drugs in the end of 99 top 2000 so i'm not gonna i mean i've said it before i i mean i played uh i played that table i i uh took a little snort of uh, some crystal meth <laughs> it got me focused to make sure i was at the top focused i could ever be you know by the way everybody 
Baptist death. Don't ever do crystal meth. But uh, anyway, so I had Phil to my immediate left. I really wasn't worried about Phil because I, I pretty much stay, told myself, stay out of Phil's way. Stay out of Dewey's way. Uh, stay and just look to get a read off people that are going to be in a lot of pots. So I um, studied Phil Gordon really well and I picked up a tell on him. But that wasn't the key. The key was I picked up a tell on Carlos. And once I... I picked up a tell, a tell on Carlos. The, the tournament was over. All I had to do is never be involved with Phil or Dewey or even Phil Gordon or anybody. Uh, just just be involved with uh, Carlos. So, um, and again, uh, that was back then before car runners decided to teach everybody bet sizing. So you... Everybody put their chips in the same, and I used to just make a living on watching people put their chips in, and I would know if they were strong or weak, and they, they just they couldn't help it, but give it, there were so many chip tells, it was a joke. So I picked up a tell on Carlos, and um, every time he raised and I saw the tell when he was weak, I would three bet him with any two cards, and that's how I was picking up my chips. So I, you know, I was chipping up nicely. I was, uh, me and Carlos were now by far first and second in chips and it didn't matter. I never had to play a hand against anybody until I was head up. As long as I, with Carlos to my right, whenever I saw the tell, I would three bet big and, uh, and pick up the pot. So. So I was cruising along in 01, and I tell people the story all the time. It's like from 98, 6, when I first learned how to play poker, my goal was to win the World Series of Poker. That was it. That was like, so I can definitely understand these young kids that are so driven because, you know, it's a dream. You know, it's like, you know, you're the best. And back then, you know, there wasn't that many people. I think in 2001, we had like, maybe three, 400 people starting the tournament. So, uh, you know, I knew how, that I was the best and, and I believed it. So, you know, I'm sitting at the main event and I was just, I'm going to win this tournament. This tournament's over. I got the tell on Carlos. I don't need to even watch anybody, whatever they do. I don't need to enter pots. All I need to do is watch Carlos who was the chip leader who was the most aggressive player when he opened pots and I saw the tell I could just three bet and chip right on up from there and as long as nobody picked up aces or kings behind me people were just full because back then when you three bet you had big hands I mean if you four bet it was aces 95% of the time or it could be kings but very you know they were it's just one of the two so I chipped up and chipped up and chipped up and I um, actually was like like almost neck and neck with Carlos. So then came the hand that I opened, um, uh, ace, and I was opening a lot, a lot, but not that much. You know, I was basically a, a lot less than I normally would. And I opened ace, deuce of diamonds, and everybody folded and it came back to Carlos and Carlos looked at me, he's in the big blind, and he three bet me with the tell. The tell was he he kind of raised his hand and moved his chip forward when he had nothing and when he was strong, he would put his chips to the side and push them out. So. I, it was every time. So now he three bets me with the weak tell, and I see it. I then um, four bet him really big, big. Left myself 600,000 behind. I already had over 600,000 in the pot. And then he five bet shoves with the tell. 
And I was snap calling him. And I've told this story many a times because I knew he had like two empty fucking chairs. I was sure of this. I was positive of this. There's no other way to say it. And right when I get ready to call, I just stopped. I pulled myself back and I said, well, what if you're wrong? Can you imagine calling off a five bet with ace deuce at the final table, six handed in the main event? And I somehow, some way, talked myself out of calling, which I'll I'll never forgive myself for this for because I know it cost me winning the world championship of 01. I looked down, I'm still at 600,000, and I think he said, thought the same thing. Oh, Mike's got, he can fold here, he's going to put me on aces or whatever. But I already had to tell, so I knew he had shit. Um, 600,000 was still probably, I don't know, maybe 50 big blinds or more. Uh, I was still like uh, fourth in chips if I folded. But uh, Anyways, I talked myself in the folding. He shows me queen eight off suit to the crowd, running up and down, and I was just sick. Now, I didn't have to win the hand anyways. I mean, ace, deuce over queen eight. I mean, we know I'm, what am I, 57, 60%, whatever it is, but... Uh, but I end up finishing sixth anyway. So if I would have called him there, like I should have, and I knew I, I was snapped. I don't. I pulled it back like four times when I was in. Insta- I don't even know how. What made me not call? But I end up not calling. I finished sixth anyways by getting cooler. Big blind, small blind, kings against eights against Phil. But um, basically, uh, I got cooler like two hands in a row. There's the one right before that. But uh, and I end up finishing sixth. Uh, but if I call F- Carlos and correctly with the tell that I saw and I, I hold the hand up, I then have 90% of the chips five-handed and I win the World Series in 2001. And instead I folded, I got knocked out sixth anyway, Carlos cruised through the final table and uh, won the World Championship. And I, um, I've told this story many times. I, I literally sat in my room at my house for three months straight and never left the house, just pondering how I could have folded that ace, deuce of diamonds when I saw the tell and I four bet him against the tell and then talked myself into calling and it cost me the, cost me the World Series about one. So something I, many days, at least once a year I think of, but I think about it all the time. I used to think about it just religiously for I can't tell you how many years. So. We are going to bring on and interview the 2018 World Series of Poker champion, John Sin. Um, And uh, we'll be right back on The Mouthpiece. Road Mouth. So now we're at the uh, Wynn desk, and this very nice lady, Michelle, is letting me have a scooter, but I'm not supposed to have one. That car got declined? And my credit card got declined. How beautiful is this? Uh, the sh- can you run that through again? Sure, absolutely. No Only for 45 bucks. Oh, wait, that shit's going to decline. So we're having credit card issues. And my other credit card is missing. Okay. Now it's my favorite part of the show where we take your phone calls here on the mouthpiece let's see what we have in store today welcome to the mouthpiece this is mike who's who am i talking with hey hey, mike you're talking to wiley down in texas how are you buddy good buddy what's uh going on on a friday night in texas well not much i was just calling to ask you about your relationship with phil helmuth the poker brat can Uh, you talk about me go ahead yeah, um, no, me and Phil are, uh, we're quite the interesting friends, I guess. Um, we're, we're good friends. Uh, Phil is Phil. <laughs> I'm glad to hear it, Mikey. You're one of my favorite poker players. And I think you and Helmuth are probably, you, you and Helmuth and maybe Helmuth and Negreanu are my favorite little rivalry slash poker pro relationship. I just love to watch you two at the same table. Well, you understand how insane I am, but, and you understand how insane Phil is. So you put 
two complete nutcases in one room, and it should be epic. So, One of the things that I like about your and Phil's relationship is even though you're known as the mouth and you're very good at agitating people and throwing them off your game, I always feel like when you try to piss Phil off, there's sort of this underlying friendship where Phil sort of knows you're messing with him in a friendly way. Uh, he it knows it. Necessarily throw him off. He knows it, but he also knows that um, he's so he's an easy target. He's because he just he, he just is. You know, like you have friends that you like to bust their balls. Well. Oh, Phil, yeah. Phil's an easy target. <laughs> I mean, it's not just me. Everybody makes fun of Phil, but they do it out of love. I mean, it's it's all out of love. And um, no matter what anybody says about Phil, he's got a heart of gold. And uh, during me recuperating from my injuries, he's one of the very few people that's um, kind of been there for me and helped me out. So... Uh, I've got nothing bad to say about Phil. All love, and uh, but he's fun. He's fun to make fun of. A lot of people don't like him because of his antics, but they don't. They don't understand him. You have to understand Phil to understand how he works. And uh, me and Phil understand each other. Uh, we're, we're good friends. So yeah, I I think that's one of the things that makes you two so fun to watch when you're at the same table. Because even though there's a ton of ball busting going on, I can I can tell that you guys are friends and it's all in good fun. Whereas sometimes when I feel like people sort of take shots at Phil, especially some of the less established pros, yeah, it's sort of mean spirited. It's out of gr- it's out of line, and I've called those people out. It's like they take it too far, and they they just don't respect the game, like the people that came before them. People don't understand, and I am so hardcore about this, that if it wasn't for me, Daniel, and Phil, um, there's many others, like Ivy and Doyle and so many others, but me, Daniel, and Phil really taken the fun in poker to a new level during the height of the poker boom. All of these kids and all these people that are making the money they're making today, they're there would be nothing there for them to make. It's we worked hard to build to market our poker, market ourselves, market just build poker to us today. So I find it really disrespectful when they talk a lot of shit about Phil and don't appreciate the people that came before them. You see a you see a lot of more recent players sort of say that Helmuth's style is outdated and that he can't win in the modern time with this conservative style. What do you think about this? Is this true? Bullshit. Okay, me and Phil talked strategy three weeks ago. Um, he cut, he put me in the main event at the LAPC, and um, I was 15th in chips with 27 to go, and I had 57 big blinds at two-hour levels, And I was playing real conservative, picking my spots. Um, They're wrong. Uh, If they're going to play two-hour, 90-minute level, two-hour level tournaments, I'll uh, I'll take my chances with me and Phil because I think we read better than 99% of the poker players. Uh, When you're dealing with 90-minute levels, hour, two-hour levels, the math kind of goes out the window. It's more of there, you have so much play post flop that, you know, if you read well, you're going to do well. So, all righty. Well, that's all I had, Mike. Thank you for taking you, my you, call. You got it. Good luck with the podcast. I, take care, buddy. Take care. Bye. Welcome to the mouthpiece. This is Mike. Uh, who am I talking with? Hey, Mike. This is Austin. What's going on, man? Austin. What's going on? Where are you from? Not a whole lot, man. I live here in Vegas. Oh, fuck yeah. What are you doing fucking home on a Friday night in Vegas? Being a good family Uh, man or? No, you know, single degenerate. Ah, uh, I like that. The one and only. No, there's a lot of single degenerates or I guess, well, nowadays, yeah, most degenerates are single. I mean. Happy to see, um, you know, someone that's been on the outskirts and dealt with the ups and downs of poker um doing a podcast instead of all these um 
just champions and beloved ones. Yeah. You know? I, I didn't really know like how podcasts works and shit. I just knew that in 2007, 2008, 2009, I was getting, this is before t the age of social media. I was getting 35,000 people per mouthpiece to the card player website. So I was like, fuck it. I'll just, um, you know, start my own podcast and just be myself. You know, I don't give a fuck what anyone says or thinks of me and whatever, you know. Well, but you do. No, I don't. You wouldn't have anyone. No, I don't. I really don't. I, I mean, okay. I, 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 I care that this is what I care about. I care when people, because I've been sick for four years, that mm -hmm. people think I can't play anymore. And then I show up at the World Series and I cash 17 out of 32 with five or six final tables and hadn't played one poker tournament in I, in a year. Or when I don't play a uh, no-limit tournament for two years and show up at the LAPC three weeks ago, finished a very disappointing 27th, and I was in a great position to give myself a chance to win. Why these motherfuckers play 50 tournaments a fucking week. That's what I care about. Other than that, I don't give a fuck. Make sense? Right. Yeah, yeah. dude. Yeah, yeah, man. I love it. Trust me. I rooting for you to win you know i always want to see the charismatic guy win over the robot well you got any questions anything you want to ask me or you want to just fucking yeah, talk um, to me it's okay to talk to me i love talking to you it's all good my first question would just be um well fuck how many questions you know? do you got i mean i said <laughs> you got a question okay give me a question what do you got well, yeah, you're 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 a nice fucking guy, and um, the first thing you know, the first negative thing I I ever heard about you was when I was playing over at um, Caesars, probably about seven or eight years ago, mm -hmm. probably when you were you know in the heyday and and killing it with everything. And, yeah, um, two thousand. You were given a cost. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, two thousand and ten. Caesars offered me two hundred fifty thousand a year to play ten hours a week, and I. <laughs> It turned it down. I thought it would it was costing me money because you know I had my full tilt money and I had I was playing real high stakes where you win or lose like thirty forty thousand every session. So I'm like, well, I mean, ten hours a week. That's I don't know. That's a lot of money playing six hundred twelve hundred mix or four eight hundred. Right. That I was yeah, yeah, and I mean it is a lot of money. And well, now give me that. I'll set this room straight. <laughs> give me that two hundred fifty thousand a year job now for ten hours a week, and I'm um, I'm all in for forty hours. Well, that's a the week. thing, man. I was figure I was figuring that you were banking back then, and um. Well, I was, but I know, was a degenerate sports. Everything better. was going good, so that's why when I heard this story, I was hearing that um you know you were you were teaching this class and you were telling players like. When you play cards, you know, don't tip the dealers or only tip them a little. No, that wasn't uh, because me. Because it cuts into the bottom line. No. And I, you, and I said, for sure. I said, for sure. Mikey that, would never say that. Never. <laughs> I was a poker a dealer. I'm all for giving the dealers as much as I can. I have the dealers' backs at all times. Okay, man. So, like, yeah. that's pretty I, You know, funny. and I thought the same, but I figured, you know, if I ever have the chance to <laughs> call and set the record straight, you know, you got to do it with the man himself. Listen, so. you can come up Good with to hear. a lot Good of shit about me. But, hey, I know um, there's a lot of fake news out there. And, oh, yeah. And fucking, I, um, and Trump is exposing it all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think it's funny, actually. Whatever. We'll get off the politics. I'm about to fuck go, the politics. Uh, We're gonna, should, listen. Should I'm gonna. Go, should I go Aria, Venetian, or when? Uh, Friday night. What what limits you play? I'm gonna play probably one two one three and then step oh, up go, to right, two go, five. I, if I, if I, I get go a, to get the run. fucking win. Go to the win. For, for yeah, if you're playing one two three, well, yeah, I play go to the win. Best environment for sure. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, man. Absolutely. Okay. And I uh, All right, buddy. You, listen, I appreciate you calling and uh Hey Mikey, dude. Good to good to you, talk to you. Good to hear your voice. You're the man. Hope Thanks for right. calling, man. Think I appreciate All right, be it. Safe, man. Be good. Bye. Right. The mouthpiece. If you'd like to take part in our phone call segment, you can give us a call at 702 329 04 
And if you're a snowflake or a pussy and you don't want to talk to me, you can email me at mouthpiecepodcast at gmail.com. Also, follow me at the Mouth Mattiso on Twitter for times that our call in segment will be live. Welcome to the Mouthpiece, and today we have a special guest, World Series of Champion, John Sin. John, what's going on, buddy? Hey, what's going on, Mike? How you doing? I am doing great. How are you doing? The rumor has it you're out and about in Miami. Is that true? I am. Yep, I and- am. I got here on, uh, I think, Thursday for... Miami Music Week. Met up with some buddies and uh, went out to a couple a uh, couple parties. A lot of fun. Yeah, um, going out to parties in Miami. That's um, either good, bad, or who knows? I could get Both. you. Know, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so um, I got a bunch. Of, well, what, how's this year been for you? Uh, I mean, this year has been. I mean, it's been great can't really complain even even since before the main uh the year was um i was really enjoying uh this this time in my life so uh and and then everything i've been able to do since the main uh has made it even better and like um how old are you i am 34 oh fuck you're right in the prime when i was Uh, partying (laughs) no no, it's true I I never had a drink or did a drug or partied or did shit till I was 2000 was that 19 years ago that makes me 31 so I partied real hard 31 through 34 and I was I had a million dollars in 2000 when a million dollars was a lot of money so I was really enjoying life so I I could see you really enjoying a life right now so uh yeah li- life's been great can't complain yeah so i got a question for you let's start off with how many new friends did you pick up over the last year uh <laughs> or I how mean, many tried to be to your friend quantify. right uh you know I, it's hard to quantify it but I, i'd like to think that all my new friends friends like sure i've met some of them because i've had new opportunities but they've they've mostly been organic friendships i think that's good that's good yeah like here's a i, I like, like there, to br- there's definitely people that try to be my friend um but it's not like it just i don't know we just don't vibe you know so it's not i'm not gonna force anything well yeah of course of course how how <laughs> i like to say this because because I've I've never been down the road of winning the main event, but I've you know I've won quite a few tournaments, and I noticed that when I whenever I win a tournament, um, I get texts from people I've never talked to in years. Did you get tons of texts from people saying, "Hey, John, congratulations, you did a good," and you're thinking, "Who the fuck is this?" <laughs> Um, I mean, there, there were definitely people that I didn't know, but I, I I mean, I I got it. I did get a ton of texts to be honest. I don't even know if I made it through all of them, (laughs) um, but most were, you know, well-intended, you know, good intentions or whatever. Yeah. I didn't feel like anyone was trying to just like, you know, get something from me. See, but I don't know. I was, I was pretty overwhelmed too. So hard that's to good say. to know because whenever they text me, I'm like, okay, that motherfucker wants money. I'm not calling him back. So, but I understand. Yeah. So yeah, I think I had. I actually think I had a decent amount of that when I two years ago when I had my 11th place run. Yeah, um, that's right. I forgot. Then, so yeah, so I think I think like those people kind of weeded themselves out a little bit. Luckily for me. I got a question for you. Um, how tired were you at the end of the main event last year? Uh, I was beat. It was it was pretty exhausting. Um, honestly, like I, I think there were like two, 
different groups of people out partying um, after I had won and I, I just couldn't go out. Uh, I just needed to like decompress and it, it was exhausting for sure. Yeah. I don't know if you know the story, but I was forced to miss the main last year because I developed a MRSA staph infection while I was playing four handed for the pot limit Omaha eight bracelet. And actually a guy named Scott Bowman, I don't know if you know who he was. He I walked back in the next day, he saw this thing on my leg and he's like, That's MRSA go to emergency room right away. I went there, they cut it out of me and I tried like I really sat in about the worst chairs possible and cut up cushions trying to find a way where I could sit. And I just said, there's no way I can make it eight days. And then after watching you play the main, I was showing my my girlfriend that, look, look how hard they're killing each other. I could never have won it. So I was, I was just like, if you can't win it, you're just stupid to not play it. So I ended up not playing it, but... Um, uh, it, sucks. it sucks, you know, but I needed somebody to kind of root for at the final table, and I really had no one. And I first I noticed Sean Deeb was coaching uh, Tony Miles, and then I then noticed that um, I mean Sean Deeb, pretty good friends, you know. So I was thinking, well, I guess I could root for him. And then I saw Bryce and Ben Lamb uh, talking with you. And um, and then I said, well, shit, these guys are pretty good friends too. So I went home, whatever, was kind of watching the main event. And I, um, <laughs> it's this, this is a funny story, but I, I, I never told this to you, but I'm sure somebody might have, but... I I noticed uh, a pretty big tell on uh, Tony Miles. <laughs> no, this is true. This yeah, is true story. I, 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 they probably told you this, right? So I, but anyways, I told Sean D. I said, um, you know, uh, your guy's got a pretty big tell. I said, uh, give me five thousand. I'll tell you what it is. I'm sure the guy Miles was paying. Uh, uh, what's his name to coach him? And he's like, oh, I can't do that. And I said, well, fuck it. Fuck you. I'm going to fucking call my friend Bryce and Ben Lamb and let him know what I saw. And then uh, the next thing I know, uh, you were attacking that tell every time. And then I told Phil, and idiot Phil goes on national TV and says, oh, Mike Madison noticed a tell, and blah, blah, blah. And the next thing you know, you had to start limping and playing small ball with him. And I'm like, thanks a lot, Phil. I mean, why don't you just fuck over my friend's uh, tell here? So uh, I'm, I know you noticed that a little bit. Yeah, I, I actually didn't hear about that until uh, until afterwards. I, yeah. I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure word got to Ben um, before during the main, but I don't think he wanted to like, uh, right. uh, you know, just like shake me with some some weird information or something. Yeah, you didn't want um, no bad information. I made sure, yeah, that's, I... and that's actually, you know, uh, I mean, it's it's cool you noticed that, but it's also, you know, I've been playing with a guy for you know, three, four days. And I have like a, I had like a team. Um, so, I mean, it, and it, and it really didn't, we didn't really get to attack it. I don't think because it was interesting because they didn't have bigger chips. Okay. Um, so eventually they just had to start pushing out stacks. Oh, so it yeah. kind of like, it kind of changed things up. Oh, that's right. Cause but, he yeah. used to like what, what his tell was. Well, you you know what his tell was, but he he when he had was forced to push him out because they didn't have big chips. It kind of took away what his tell was. So I see what you're saying. That makes total sense because uh, he would with the side. Well, I don't want to go over the guy's tell because if he didn't fix it by now, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but and you know what you're. I know exactly what you're saying because the it, it forced everyone to push those chips out, which 
took away the tell that you you had. So um, that was this is a you know it's a question that I was wondering why I was why I was stuck home watching this tournament and uh, but I was very yeah, impressed. But it, was, you know. it was interesting, like not only you guys, but I definitely I wasn't able to check them, and I, I have no idea whether these tells are uh, true or not. Mm-hmm. But people were definitely texting me during uh, and, and e- sending me emails like hey, we noticed this stuff or this pattern, you should really use that. And I, I don't know if it was true or not, but I think it was pretty cool that, you know, people were really watching and, and getting into it enough to, like, you know, try and uh, have their own game plan and stuff like that. So yeah. that was cool. Well, I, had, I, I, I had not even met you before, but um, Bryce is a good friend, Ben's a good friend. Oh, John's the coolest guy you'll ever meet. You know, you and him be great. You don't know he's the coolest. And I'm like, well, if he's that cool, I'm like, hey, I'm sitting here. Anything I can do to have somebody to root for and give them any information. I didn't. I was like, that's all good. You know, I'm all for good people. You know, I'm sure Tony Miles is a good guy too. But you know, you know. Yeah, like, I think the whole final table is it, it was a really great group of guys. Yeah. So. I'm going to have this question for you. Let's go to more of a kind of a serious note here. So many World Series of Poker main event champions before you have disappeared or shied away from the limelight. Joe McKean prefers to be an asshole, which he is. Um, He turns down photos, autographs from fans. Do you think that the World Series of Poker winner has a responsibility to be an ambassador? Um, I know that's the title that's given. And, Mm -hmm. you know, to be honest, it's not something that you expect when you when you win it. Like, I, I didn't. You know, I had no idea that this title was given to you when I won it. Mm-hmm. Um, and but also to be honest, I think it's I think poker's a lot different now than uh, years prior. Right. Uh, I mean, I, I definitely had you know some fair share of people coming up to me wanting photos and autographs and messages and stuff like that. Um, and and it was a lot more like right after I won the main. Mm-hmm. But it hasn't been too bad. Everyone's been really good about it, and it definitely hasn't been overwhelming by any means. Um, but I, I could imagine, you know, uh, years prior when people wanted that, it, it could have been um, a do, lot worse. Cause do I, you I embrace a lot more mainstream back then. Do you embrace the fact that, like, you won the tournament and – you know, people recognize you as the current World Series of Poker champion. I mean, and when people come up to you and they ask you things about them, I mean, you embrace like winning the tournament. In other words, do you for taking away the money? Um, just knowing how good a player you knew you you you've always been, and doing something basically I've dreamed about doing since the day I stepped foot in poker in 96. So how did it, when it really set in, whether it's a day or probably a couple days later, because the next day you were probably sleeping all day, uh, what did it feel like? Uh, I mean, I was in shock and there, there was a lot of stuff going on, you know, a lot of interviews, yeah. um, a lot of friends and family in town, Right. Uh, a lot of meetings, you know, things you got to set up with mm-hmm. like, you know, lawyers, CPAs, advisors, right. whatever. Right. Um, so there wasn't, you know, a ton of time for me to like sit back and think about it. Right. Um, but I, I think I embrace it to a certain point. Um, you know, like it, if people want to come up, take pictures, autographs, ask me a question or two, I'm, I'm happy to do it. Right. Uh, if I feel like they're trying to, you know, out of nowhere sit down with me and like have like an hour long conversation with me about the main event. I, I'm not going to be so right. much about it. Um, but you know, for like 99% of, you know, things that have happened to me so far, I, uh, I've enjoyed it. It, it hasn't been too much, but I, I could definitely see, uh, how it could be too much for some people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do you think, uh, like let's, 
going into the World Series coming up here in a month and a half. So let's see. Uh, so the first of July, the main event is going to start, and of course, everybody, you're probably thinking, you know, the odds of me winning. I mean, you know that the odds of me winning it again are just so astronomical. But you did go 11th, and then you come back and won it. You're going into this main event thinking, I want to go on the biggest run of ever in this. <laughs> I know you are got to be thinking that, right? Or what is your mindset? I, I try. I really try to keep the mindset of, you know, wanting to play my best right. and being happy be. with whatever happens. Mm -hmm. But there's, you know, there's definitely thoughts of what if, you yeah, know, what if course. I go on another sick run and, you know, win it again, go back to back. That would just be insane. Oh, yeah. um, it would make you but an I instant mean, legend. I mean, yeah. You already are a legend, but I mean, talking like legend, legend, legend status. So, right. Right. Oh, I can imagine. It, it, yeah. Uh, it, it'd be cool. Um, it's fun to think about. But at the end of the day, like I said, I'm going to be, you know, I'm just going to be trying to get in my zone and play my best and being happy with the result. It's great. Th great thought process. I, um, Every time I've I've had a success at a tournament, I always tell myself, one hand at a time, one hour at a time, one day at a time, play your best. You can't control anything else. And as long as you're happy right. how you played, um, that's it. Now, if you and, make a mistake. And I just, oh, I just ran insane during the main event. Did you? But it, it was, yeah, it was, it was crazy. I mean, we probably played 10, 11 days, and, you know, more than half of those days, half of those days were probably – like the luckiest days I've had in poker, you know, it was just yeah. insane. The cards I got. And I, I just, you know, I just kept thinking to myself, like, I, I can't keep running this good. And I just kept <laughs> running that good. You know, it was crazy. <laughs> it's true. I mean, now I personally believe now this. Now you, you can answer what you're, I tell people all the time. They said, cause I used to go deep in so many, many and they go, what's your secret? And I said, well, the secret is it's the only tournament in the whole world you never have to bluff and you just basically survive and watch everybody in front of you who has chips to get tired and implode. Did you notice uh, as deeper as the deeper you went in a tournament, people would like blow up their stacks and you're like, wow, I can't believe he did that. Did you notice that? Yeah, it was uh, it was definitely crazy. Like, no matter how far you got, uh, you, every time you look back at the clock, you know someone was always busting, and right. so uh, it definitely it, it definitely helps to be patient for sure. Yeah, um, where did you bluff a lot in the main event, or did you you were just running so good you didn't have? Well, you probably got so many chips you never really had to. You probably were able to bluff uh, a lot. I definitely remember a couple bluffs, mm -hmm. and I definitely remember them not working. <laughs> exactly. So every time, every year, I tell myself, "Don't ever bluff in the main event," and because we're poker players, we can't help ourselves. So, uh, and, yeah, yeah, my bluffs. I think, there were, work there, I think there were two points in the tournament I got short because I had bluffed off a lot of chips, mm -hmm. and then you know, part of my run good, I, I was just lucky enough to get a hand good enough to get in and and win so i i heard you've been doing a lot of charity work since your big win um that's really great and i respect you a lot from that um what is the reason you think it's so important to do charity work you know that uh wow that's a good question the reason i think it's so important i think the world would just be a better place if everybody tried to help everybody oh i agree and uh you know it, it it's hard to change the world but you can you can at least help you know absolutely and if, if everybody was helping uh doing a little bit of something and, and you know it doesn't even have to be much it's not like no you don't have to you know spend time going to charities or anything like that you know if you're just like legitimately just improving you know just your daily conversations with people and making people's lives better that way, like I think the ripple effect is is big enough that you know, like I, I don't believe in 
karma per se where like you do something good something good happen has to happen back to you okay, um, I agree. but from a selfish perspective like you know if you put a lot of good out there mm -hmm. it, it's gonna come back like somehow in some way uh, it's gonna help improve your life as I well keep, so. I, I keep waiting for that but yeah I I, I, I <laughs> <laughs> the mouthpiece I hope you enjoyed part one of the mouthpiece with my World Series of Poker main event experiences and our interview with 2018 world champion John Sin. Tune in tomorrow for part two of our continuing coverage with World Series of Poker champion John Sin. The Mouthpiece.